Uh, welcome everybody to our meeting this afternoon and I pray that God will bless us as we uh, spend time looking at his word again and I thank Dave for his uh, prayer. And we're going to continue looking at um, a subject we looked at this morning and get some more added information from the scriptures concerning this very vital topic that we're going to look at. So I'm just going to share the screen now to begin our presentation. So again, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Three Angels Message Sermon Series. And this is a continuation of Sermon number 22, which is the topic was uh, Hellfire. So this is a supplementary study on Hellfire. Now, Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So here we read that as a result of the wrath of God, people will be tormented with fire and brimstone, and that the smoke of their torment of it will ascend or be going on forever and ever. And Jesus says these words in Mark 9, 47, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. So here we read of hell fire. And in our previous sermon, we looked at how long forever and ever was and fire and brimstone or hell fire and saw what it meant and when it takes place. We asked, is it really a place of eternal torment for the wicked? We saw that there is much confusion in the realms of Christianity concerning this all-important topic, and there are millions of people who hate God because of this teaching of eternally burning hell. However, we saw that forever and ever is only as long as it lasts, and that the lake of fire and brimstone happens around and after the time of the second coming of Jesus. It is not burning now. We also looked at what is called an unquenchable fire and asked, does this mean eternal fire? Because according to the popular concept of hellfire, it will be an unquenchable fire burning forever and ever. However, again, we saw that unquenchable is a fire that cannot be put out before it has consumed everything that can burn. And this hellfire will finally go out when there is nothing left to burn. In this sermon, we will look at some very interesting verses, some of which seem to support this doctrine and see what they really mean, this false doctrine, I should say, and see what they really mean by comparing Scripture with Scripture so we can come up with the truth of the matter on this doctrine of hellfire so you won't have to believe a lie of Satan any longer. And remember the little saying that we have been using throughout these sermons, what saith the Bible, this my only question be, the teachings of men so often mislead us, but what saith the Bible to me? Or what saith the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? And thank God God has given us the Bible, brothers and sisters, because it is a blessing. The teachings of men so often mislead us, but what saith the Bible to me? Where would we be without the Bible? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue this study on hellfire and we look at some uh, interesting verses throughout this uh, talk, we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to bless us with wisdom and understanding and help us to discern the truth of the matter and to know what, what is truth so that we will no longer or people will no longer uh, be led astray by a lie of Satan and especially this lie, because it's so diabolical. So bless us now, dear Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So Psalm 11, verse 6. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. In our previous sermon, we asked, when did the Lord first use fire and brimstone to punish the wicked? And we read in Genesis 24 and 25, 19, 24 and 25, these words. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from heaven, from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But the same day the, the Lord Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Luke 17, 29. It was upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And in 2 Peter 2, verse 6, it says, In turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. And Jude, verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh or homosexuality, are set forth, for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So according to Peter and Jude, these cities suffered as an example of the reward of the immoral and the wicked and ungodly fire and brimstone or eternal fire. Now we ask the question, are Sodom and Gomorrah burning now? And the answer to that is no. They are exactly what the Bible say, said they are, ashes. Now, continuing this sword on fire and brimstone, we read, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, Revelation 19, 20. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever, Revelation 20, 10. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, Revelation 22, verse 8. Now, notice here, and this is one of the first points for us to remember, notice here that those who end up in the lake of fire and brimstone, including the devil, are alive, not dead. So they haven't physically died and then gone there, as many teach and believe. We'll look more at this sort of alive and dead later on. Now let's look again at the words tormented day and night forever and ever. We've already established that forever and ever is only for as long as it lasts. Therefore, they will be tormented day and night for as long as as it lasts. So when and where is this torment? Again, we have already established that this torment is Babylon's. But let us read these verses again to draw some more conclusions. So Revelation 18, 9 and 10. When they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment. Who are they? that are standing afar off for the fear of her torment. The kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth. And when is this happening? During the time of the seven last plagues, especially from the sixth onwards. So are these people alive or dead? They are alive and living upon the earth, not dead, and in hellfire. Now, when and where are they who are tormented with fire and brimstone? Revelation 14, verses 9 and 10 says, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead in his hand, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. It happens in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. And when is this happening? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels 
in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this takes place at the second coming of Jesus at the end of the seven last plagues. So again, are these people alive or dead? They are alive and living upon the earth, not dead and in hellfire. Verse 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, when does the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever? It happens when they are tormented with fire and brimstone at the second coming of Jesus in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb at the end of the seven last plagues. Now, Revelation 18, 9 and 10, going back to this verse, when they shall see the smoke of her burning standing afar off for fear of her torment. Who are witnessing the smoke of her, her burning? The kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth and everyone else who's, a, who's on the earth at the time. So again, are these people alive or dead? Again, they are alive and living upon the earth, not dead and in hell fire. So as we have looked at these verses, we have seen that the smoke of their torment happens when they are burning with fire and brimstone at the second coming of Jesus in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. At the end of the seven last plagues, while they are alive and living upon the earth, and not dead and in hell fire. Now, these verses we have seen, especially the ones found in the third angel's message, are used by many Christians to help prove the doctrine of eternal hell fire. But as we have compared scripture with scripture and looked at these verses in their true context and chronology of events, we have seen that this is not the case. Now, let us continue to look at some more Bible verses that are used to attempt to prove this false doctrine of eternal hellfire. Jesus says, and we've looked at this verse before, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed and having two hands going to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9, 43 and 44. We've already seen what is meant by the unquenchable fire. The next question is, what is meant by the worm dieth not? To answer that question, we need to ask another question. Where do worms live? Now, I hope you're answering these questions in your own mind as I'm going through these questions. Where do worms live? In the ground or soil? Now, where do people usually go when they die? into a grave in the ground. What eventually happens to the body of the dead when they are in the grave? It rots or sees corruption. Now, prophetically, the Bible says of Jesus in Psalm 16, verse 10, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. How long does it take for corruption to set in? Speaking of Lazarus, Lazarus, we read, John eleven thirty nine, 39, Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. 
It is four days. How long was Jesus dead and in Joseph's tomb or the grave for? In Matthew 16, verse 21, Jesus, uh, we speak of Jesus and he says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things to the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And in Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus says, when we looked at this verse before, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus was dead in Joseph's tomb or the grave for no more than three days, and therefore his body did not see corruption. Now, speaking of this corruption, Paul says of the believer that at the second coming of Jesus, when they hear the trump or trumpet of God, that the dead shall be raised incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52. Here we see that at this time the dead are raised incorruptible and not beforehand. So no one, I shouldn't say no one, but the majority of the people that have died in the grave from the time of Adam till now are still in the grave. So in the grave, the dead begin their corruption within four days. And what aids them in this corruption? You got it, worms. And of these worms, Job says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job 19 25 and 26. Here Job says that even though when he is dead, he will see God in his flesh after the worms have destroyed or eaten up his body. And when did he say that would be? When his Redeemer, Jesus, shall stand at the latter day, the time of his second coming. Now, there is a very interesting point I want to bring out of these verses about the worms, and that is, who is not dying? So let's go back to Mark 9, verse 43 and 44, and we'll just read the bold section. Then having two hands go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So who is not dying here? Jesus says it's the worms that die not. And what is the state? What state are those that they are eating in? They are dead and in their graves. Now, going back to a previous verse we saw, let us begin to look at another point. Psalm 16:10. Speaking of Jesus, says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Here we read of the soul in hell. But where or what is this hell? In a previous sermon, we saw that many Bible writers called death asleep. Now, when you sleep, usually when you sleep, what position are you usually in? You are lying down. And the Bible says, free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave. Psalm 83, verse 5. 88, sorry, the sun's shining. 88, verse 5. I think I might have to move my head. Sorry. Let's see the. Oh, sorry. It's better. Just give me a minute. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Now, in Job 17, verses 13 and 14, he says, If I wait in the grave, if I wait, the grave is mine house. I have made my bed in the darkness. I have said to corruption, Thou art my father, to the worm, Thou art my mother and my sister. 
So these verses say that when you die or sleep, you lie in the grave or bed where you turn into corruption and where the worm is. Now, David says this in Psalm 139 and verse 8. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Here David says that we make our bed, not not we make our bed in hell. Well, I shouldn't say we, but he's saying, if even if I make my bed in hell, thou art there. So he talks about bed being in hell. So by comparing these verses, it seems that the grave and this hell are the same thing. And let me read this in the Revelation. In chapter 20, verses 5 and 13, it says this, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And Jesus says this in John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So all those unsaved who died before the thousand years or the millennium will come forth from their graves at the resurrection of damnation and death and hell or the grave will deliver up the rest of the dead or the wicked to be judged according to their works. And then after the sentence of the executive judgment is pronounced upon the wicked, including Satan, we read, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 14 and 15. So it seems here that there are two hells. Hell or the grave where you go when you die, and hell fire or the lake of fire and brimstone, which happens after the millennium when death and hell or the grave where death and hell or the grave end up. Also, it seems that along with there being two hells, there are also two fire and brimstone events. And with both hells and fire and brimstones, one of each occurs before the millennium and the other of each after it. Now, we are seeing where death and hell or the grave end up, in the lake of fire and brimstone. Then the question is, what happens to the lake of fire and brimstone? Revelation 20, 14, we saw this, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Again, it seems here that there are also two deaths. And again, one is prior to the millennium and the other after it. So death and hell, or the grave, end up in the lake of fire and brimstone or hellfire, which is the second death. So if hellfire or the lake of fire and brimstone is the second death, then the next question must be, what happens to the second death? The very next verse of the Bible says this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Revelation 21 verse 1. And what is not in this new heaven and new earth? There shall be no more death, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. There is no more death. So once death and hell or the grave are cast into the lake of fire and brimstone or hellfire, where Satan and his angels and the wicked of all ages end up, which is the second death, death will be no more. And so too will hellfire. And the Bible says these things about the end of the wicked. And when you look, it says here, for evildoers shall be cut off for yet a little while and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt, consider, shalt diligently consider his place and it shall not be. Psalm 37, 9 and 10. 
I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not, was not. Yea, I saw him, but he could not be found. Psalm 37, 35 and 36. The transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. Psalm 37, verse 38. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke shall they consume away. Psalm 37, verse 20. So we have seen in these verses, just from Psalm 37, that the wicked will be cut off and will perish. They shall not be. They have passed away and they shall consume away and be destroyed. Now, by looking at all these words or phrases, does this sound like the wicked will be burning in an eternal hellfire? No, it doesn't. In fact, it says that the place of the wicked will be diligently sought for and shall not be found, for it was not. Now, just on that, just on this point before we move on, a thought just came to my mind. It says it shall be diligently found, uh, diligently sought for and shall not be found, for it was not. So let me ask the question. If you go to a cemetery or a cemetery where someone you know is buried, will you be able to find, will you find it? The answer is yes, you will know it is there. So if the wicked are in hell burning forever, will you know where they are? Yes, you will. But the Bible says the wicked will be diligently sought for and shall not be found for it was not. Now, before we ask who is not dying, and we saw that it is the worm, I will now ask another question. What is the sending up forever and ever? Revelation 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. It is the smoke of their torment. And what are they being tormented with? Fire and brimstone. And eventually the lake of fire and brimstone. Now, where does smoke come from? I'm sure you've all heard the saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. So the smoke is ascending up from the burning of the fire and brimstone. And when will that burning cease? When there is nothing left to burn and the wicked become ashes. They will consume away as smoke and eventually the smoke just disappears. And the wicked, they shall be as though they had not been, Obadiah 16. Now, as I said before, this all sounds completely contrary to what is being taught by the majority of Christianity. In fact, let us read what a couple, a couple of quotes from some Protestant preachers to get the gist of what they believe. Great Controversy, page 534, says this. Said a learned, learned doctor of divinity, the sight of hell torments will exalt the happiness of the saints forever. When they shall see others who are of the same nature and born under the same circumstances plunged in such misery, and they so distinguished, it will make them sensible of how happy they are. Another used these words. While the decree of reprobation is eternally executing on the vessels of wrath, the smoke of their torment will be eternally ascending in view of the vessels of mercy, who, instead of taking part of these miserable objects, will say, Amen, Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. What a diabolical teaching is this false doctrine of eternal hellfire. How repugnant to every emotion of love and mercy and even to our sense of justice is the doctrine that the wicked dead are tormented with fire and brimstone in an eternally burning hell, that for the sins of a brief earthly life, 
They are to suffer torture as long as God shall live. Will the redeemed in heaven be lost to all emotions of pity and compassion and even to feelings of common humanity? Are these to be exchanged for the indifference of the stoic or the cruelty of the savage? Yet this doctrine has been widely taught and is still embodied in many of the creeds of Christendom, where in the pages of God's word is such teaching to be found. No, no, such is not the teaching of the book of God. And praise God for that. Those who present the views expressed in their quotations given above may be learned and even honest men, but they are deluded by the sophistry of Satan. He leads them to misconstrue strong expressions of scripture, giving to the language the colouring of bitterness and malignity, which pertains to himself, but not to our creator. What a di oh, No person who is a true Christian and believer in God and his word should ever believe or teach such terrible things. In our great controversy 536 says, it is beyond the power of human mind, of the human mind, to estimate the evil which has been wrought by the heresy of eternal torment. The religion of the Bible, full of love and goodness and abounding in compassion, is darkened by superstition and clothed with terror. When we consider in what false colours Satan has painted the character of God, we can wonder that our merciful creator is feared, dreaded and even hated. The appalling views of God which have spread over the world from the teaching of the pulpit, teachings of the pulpit have made thousands, yes, millions of sceptics and infidels. Now, Mind, Character and Personality, Volume 1, page 59, says this. Sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. And what is one of the causes of this? There are erroneous doctrines also as that of an eternally burning hell and the endless torment of the wicked that by giving exaggerated and distorted views of the character of God have produced the same result upon sensitive minds. So this doctrine of hellfire can affect people's mental stability. False doctrine of hellfire. Well, today in this morning's sermon on hellfire and in this afternoon's supplementary study on hellfire, we've been looking at this subject of an eternally burning hell and the endless torment of the wicked and seen the truth of the matter and seen that it is not so and that hellfire eventually finishes and there will be a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no more death. And speaking of this new heavens and new earth, where there will be no more death, the verse goes on to say, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and they shall be, there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. Now let me make a point by asking you a question. If hellfire is an eternally burning hell with an endless torment of the wicked, will there still be sorrow and pain and tears and crying? And will the former things be passed away? Well, the obvious answer to that is no, they won't. But the Bible says that the former things will be passed away and therefore there will be no more death or hellfire or an eternally burning hell or an endless torment of the wicked or everlasting fire. Hallelujah and praise God for this truth. And as we learned before, the theory of eternal torment is one of the false doctrines that constitute the wine of the abomination of Babylon, of which she makes all the nations drink. The ministers of Christ should have accepted this heresy and proclaimed it from their sacred desk is indeed a mystery. And it's the same as Sunday. It's indeed a mystery why, why Protestants still hold on to Sunday and preach it from the Bible, uh, from the pulpit, sorry. And it's the same with this doctrine of eternally burning hell. 
They received you from Rome as they received the false Sabbath. So again, hallelujah and praise God for this truth. At this point of time, I would like us to now look at a few famous verses of the Bible and see what they say. Or more importantly, what they don't say. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Here in this verse we read that Jesus has suffered the penalty for our sins. Now if the penalty for sin is an eternally burning hell fire, why is Jesus not burning in hell now? Ezekiel 18.4 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. This verse does not say, The soul that sinneth shall live forever in an eternally burning hell. No, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And it's the soul that sins as well, because many people believe, Christians believe, that the body stays in the grave, but the soul goes to heaven or hell. But here we read, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So two points here. One, the wages of sin is death, not eternal hellfire. Two, eternal life is only through Jesus Christ. And a wicked soul who has not accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour cannot burn in hell forever or he will have eternal life. And now here is the most famous verse of the Bible in which Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that is, whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Jesus says, Believe in me and live, and if you don't, you will perish. He does not say, You will burn in hell fire forever. On the other hand, Satan's first lie was, if you sin, you shall not surely die. Instead, you will live on and either burn forever in hellfire or go straight to heaven when your life on earth is ended. And if you're alive in an everlasting fire, then aren't you having everlasting life? As we have gone through these two sermons on hellfire, especially this one, we have constantly been reading these words, die, death, dead, perish, cut off, passed away, second death, destruction, destroy, destroyed, consumed, shall not be, was not, could not be found, and had not been. Now, do any of these words suggest an eternally burning hell or an endless torment of the wicked in hellfire? I think we know the answer to that. No, they don't. And moreover, the lake of fire and brimstone or hellfire will cease burning when Satan and his angels and the wicked shall consume away and become ashes and smoke. And then there will be a, a new heavens and a new earth where there will be no more death for the former things will be passed away. Again, hallelujah and praise God for this truth. Well, my friends and brothers and sisters, we have been looking at the subject of the doctrine of hellfire or false or just the doctrine of hellfire. And we have seen the truth of the matter concerning it. We have also seen that the false doctrine of an eternally burning hell or an endless torment of the wicked in hellfire forever is part of the wine of her or Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church's fornication. And concerning the wine of her fornication, we read in the second angel's message, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we've looked at some of this fornication. We've looked at Babylon as being fallen. We saw that this woman, who is the great whore, 
whose name is Mystery Babylon the Great, is the church that is at Babylon or Rome or the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. We saw that gradually over a period of a few centuries, the church in Rome or Babylon started becoming corrupt and they departed from the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. They started giving heed to seducing spirits and teaching doctrines of devils, speaking lies. And we looked at some of these topics about Babylon being fallen. We looked at mystery, Babylon the Great, death, is it the end of us, messengers from the grave, Sunday or Lord's Day, and behold, I come as a thief. We saw that the wine of her fornication is the false doctrines of the church that is at Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, that have been introduced into Christianity by her, some of which we looked at in those five sermons. And today we've been looking at hell fire. And today we have looked at the false doctrine of an eternally burning hell or an endless torment of the wicked in hell fire the most diabolical of these false doctrines of Babylon. So indeed, Babylon is fallen. And this is the second angel's message. This is a message that has to go to the world. And just on this point, as we bring this supplementary study on hellfire to a close, as we see that this false doctrine of an eternally burning hell or an endless torment of the wicked in hell fire forever is a part of the wine of her, Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church's fornication, it is therefore also a part of the doctrines of devils. And speaking of the false doctrine of this whore, Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, we read this warning from God in Proverbs 5, 3 to 7. For the lips of a strange woman, or a whore, drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to hell, her steps take hold, oh sorry, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children. Depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. And because of this, Babylon, the papacy, wants you to receive of her seven last plagues, the wrath of God, and to be part of the smoke of her burning, her torment with fire and brimstone and ultimately be in the lake of fire and brimstone or hell fire, the everlasting fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels, which is the second death, which none of us need to be a part of, so you will be destroyed with them and miss out on eternal life. So, my friends, brothers and sisters, let us hear the call of Jesus when he says to us, come out of her or Babylon, my people, so that when at his second coming, we may not be a part of the destruction by fire and brimstone, and then after the millennium not end up with the devil and his angels in the lake of fire and brimstone or hellfire or the everlasting fire, and not be a part of the second death, but will be with Jesus when he creates a new heaven and a new earth that he died to give us. In AM 1, verse 9, again we read, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. So we have been looking at this doctrine of hellfire and we've been going through this supplementary study on hellfire this afternoon. And we looked at the third angel's message and we won't read these messages. We We'll just quickly go through this. But it says, if any man worship the beast. And then we looked at the image of the beast, the image, beast, and a little horn. We looked at the sea beast, the two horned beast, the battle of Armageddon, the wrath of Babylon, and the wrath of God. And today we've been looking at hell fire. 
So this is a message of any if of the third angel's message, if any man worship the beast. This is the third angel's message. And today we're going to look at the first dominion restored. We're going to see the end result of this great controversy and what God really has in store for those who are willing to accept him as their Lord and Saviour. And this will be the three angels and messages. Well, my friends, we have seen through this sermon that this diabolical doctrine of eternal torment in hellfire is a liar Satan designed to get you to hate God and think of him as mean and unloving. But instead we have seen who is the mean and unloving one, Satan, the one who wants you to be with him in that lake of fire, which is the second death. So you will not have the eternal life that Jesus died for you to have and cease to exist like him. And be as though you had not been. Now, in closing, this is what the Bible says of what God thinks about the final work of executive judgment and hellfire. And we looked at these verses in our previous sermon, but God calls it a strange work as to bring pass, to pass his strange act. And in the end of it, he says he wants us to give ear and hear his voice and hearken and hear his speech, Isaiah 28, 21 to 23. The Bible says that to our merciful God, this act or work of punishment or consumption is a strange act. It is something that he does not want to do. And this is why he pleads with us to hear his voice and hearken to his speech. And what does he say? Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Ezekiel 18, 31 and 32. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. I want to share with you these words of the Bible, which is God's desire for each and every human being, for you and I. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Esther 8, verse 6. Yes, my friends, Jesus, our elder brother and advocate in heaven, cannot endure to see you destroyed in hellfire. He wants you to be saved to everlasting life with him. But it's your choice. It's my choice. Will you continue in the pleasures of sin for a season? and then perish, or will you cease to do evil and learn to do well and live forever in eternal life? God says to you, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. I pray, my friends, that you will choose life and good, for he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou, both thou and thy seed may live. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. So, in closing, let us feed this invitation from God. In Isaiah 26, verses 20 and 21, God says to us, Come, my people. Enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Let us heed these warnings of God. And so we may escape the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death, and that when Jesus comes back, we'll be able to have eternal life with him in that earth made new, where there will be no more death or sorrow or pain 
or crying, or the former things shall be passed away. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the messages of your word. We thank you that your word is its own interpreter. We thank you that your word is truth. And it's sad that people, like Peter said, that who, who, who rest the scriptures to their own destruction. They misquote, misinterpret the Bible, and they bring out all these damnable heresies. And this damnable heresy we've looked at today of hellfire, what a diabolical teaching it is. This is has nothing to do with who you are, Lord. It's everything who Satan wants to be and what he would be if he gained control of this world. It's, it's in the universe. It's everything that man, fallen man wants to be because we have, mankind has such wicked natures without you. And we can see this in the world today with all the wars and all the atrocities that, it, that goes on between mankind. Lord, have mercy on us. But we thank you, Father, that in your love for us, you gave your only begotten son, that we may not perish, but have everlasting life. So I pray, Lord, that we will take hold of this everlasting life, that we will not believe these false doctrines of Babylon, but we will believe the truth of your word, the true doctrine that will save our souls. So I bless us now, Lord, and thank you for this opportunity we've had to share your word together today. And bless us now, I pray in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. I'll just finish the um, recording.